If you would open your Bibles to the book of Psalm, Psalm chapter 30, and uh, uh, we began something a few weeks ago called He Turned It, and then uh, of course we had a great Christmas production last Sunday, and it would have been a great time to just start something different on this Sunday, but I just felt like we weren't through yet. And so I just want to wrap a few things up here that I believe the Lord has for us. On this last Sunday, let me just say this. I, I, I just believe there's always something special on the last Sunday of the year. And um, on a Sunday, I actually talked to a, a, another pastor, and um, he, he was saying, hey, you know, are y'all having church on the last Sunday of the year? And I laughed because, uh, you know, anybody that knows me or, or us or this church knows that uh, we don't cancel church for very much, you know, not very often, especially Sundays and uh, that sort of thing. So he said, well, I know a lot of churches that that because people are gone for the Christmas holidays, you know, they just cancel that Sunday. I said, actually, you know what? The Sunday right after Christmas, the last Sunday of the year, always tends to be one of our best Sundays. It just seems like the people that come are just so hungry and so ready, anticipating God's grace and God's goodness and ready to get back together. And so with all that, I said, yeah, no, we're not canceling service. So guess what, y'all? We're here. <laughs> we're here. And I believe God has something special for us. Psalm 30. And uh, I'm just going to go ahead and read the whole chapter to you. Are you ready for this? Reading from the New King James Version of the Bible. And uh, this is a psalm of David uh, that is to be sung or was to be sung at the dedication of his house. It says this in verse 1. I will extol you, O Lord, for you have lifted me up and have not let my foes rejoice over me. O Lord, my God, I cried out to you and you healed me. O Lord, you brought my soul up from the grave. You have kept me alive that I should not go down to the pit. Sing praise to the Lord, you saints of his, and give thanks at the remembrance of his holy name. For his anger is but for a moment and his favor is for life. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. Now in my prosperity, I said, I shall never be moved. Lord, by your favor, you have made my mountain stand strong. You hid your face and I was troubled. I cried out to you, O Lord, and to the Lord I made supplication. What profit is there in my blood when I go down to the pit? Will the dust praise you? Will it declare your truth? Hear, O Lord, and have mercy on me. Lord, be my helper. You have turned for me my mourning into dancing, and you have put off my sackcloth and clothed me with gladness to the end that my glory may sing praise to you and not be silent. O Lord, my God, I will give thanks to you forever. Amen. Amen. Again, the psalmist David, he's writing this as, of course, he's remembering how far far the Lord has brought him, how good he has been to him. At one point in his life, he was sleeping in a cave and being hunted down, but now he's no longer being hunted by the king. He's no longer in a cave. Now he's got his own place. Praise God, a beautiful home, very blessed, and now he is a great king, so He's gone from the cave, he's gone from being hunted by the king to now living in a beautiful home, dedicating his house to the Lord, and now he is a great king. The Lord has brought him a long ways. The Lord has brought him a long ways, and at the very end of this chapter, he says something very powerful. He says, O Lord my God, I will give thanks to you forever. Oh, Lord, my God, I will give thanks to you forever. He talks about how he's turned his mourning into dancing. He's put off the sackcloth of what would be mourning and despair and and what was total loss and yet turned it into a, a place of great blessing. And he says, you've put on joy. You've given me everlasting joy. And at the end, he says, because you've done all of this, because of how good you have been, because of how faithful you have been, because you have turned things around in my life. He says, I will give thanks to you forever. I will give thanks to you forever. Aren't you grateful for a God who turns things around? Aren't you thankful that he's turned things around in your life time and time and time again? Anybody remember the, the, the time that he really turned it around? I mean, you 
received his grace and his salvation and his mercy and his love and he poured his life and his love and his joy and his peace into you and really just brought you out of what would be darkness, Colossians says, and brought you into the light, out of the kingdom of darkness and brought you into a whole new kingdom. The new King James says that is, that is the son of his love. You've been brought out of the power of darkness and now into a kingdom that's filled with the son of God's love. Praise God. What a wonderful, what a, anybody know what I'm talking about today? What a wonderful position you are in today. What a wonderful place you are in today. You're, you're in a place of light, a place of blessing, a place where he has turned things around and now you are to be thankful for how good he has been to you. The psalmist David said, I'm thankful to you and I will be thankful forever I will be thankful to you. Forever I will be thankful to you. David was living in a time in a dispensation before Jesus came. How much more should we be thankful after we've seen the fullness of God's grace, the fullness of God's mercy, the fullness of his compassion toward humanity, the fullness of how he, his, his judgment and his wrath has been appeased because of the blood of Jesus. Hallelujah. How much more should we be full of thanks for how good God has been to us? Praise God. He says, I will, I will give thanks to you forever. I'm never going to stop giving thanks to you. Never going to stop giving thanks to you. Hallelujah. I was looking through uh, my Facebook just this past week around Christmas, and you see what everybody's doing, the holidays and all the fun they're having, all the stuff they're doing with their family and the kids and the presents and all the stuff that's going on. And, and um there's something they're doing, I guess, at the at this end, the end of the year, called year-end review or something like that. Anybody know what I'm talking about? It's a year-end review, and basically, it'll 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 put up your most likes or most whatever pictures, you know, for about ten of them. And you flip through there, and it'll show. And so everybody's posting their year-end review, so you can as if you really want to see everything that they did last year. Anyway, um, so you, I did. I looked at a few, and so I'm looking through what's going on, and then it says you can check yours, you know. And so I'm like, I want to see what mine looks like. And of course, they want you to post it. I didn't, but, uh, but I may later. Um, but I didn't yet. So I looked at it. I'm looking at all the things that, that have happened this past year, I'm thinking about God's faithfulness and how wonderful he's been. I was, uh, one of the things that pulled up was it, it pulled up a time when we were having water baptism right here, right here in the front, and it showed some of the people that were getting baptized and I thought about how good God has been, how faithful he's been, the people who've made decisions for Jesus, praise God. It pulled up another time where we went out and did reach and I thought about all the people that have gotten saved and the gospel that's gone forth all around central Louisiana just this past year. It pulled up uh, me and my wife on our anniversary and our anniversary trip and I thought about how faithful God has been to us for 15 years in our marriage, how good he's been. Not that we've never had any bumps in the road or any challenges, but how good God has has been through every time and every season, every moment of our life. And whether you're single or whether you're married or whether you got baptized this year or not, you can still think about the faithfulness of God this past year. You can take a moment and instead of taking a year in review of Facebook, you could take a year in review of God's faithfulness for a whole year. If you just went all the way back to January, and even if you hit a few bumps in the road or had a few great challenges, you can still look and see how God was faithful right in the middle of those moments, right in what may have been dark times or challenging times, how God's grace was sufficient right in the middle of those moments, how his Holy Spirit didn't leave you, how God didn't forsake you, but he was an ever-present help right in those times, right in those times of trouble. Even the scripture that says many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers them. That means he lifts you up, praise God, right in the middle of those moments. It's a good opportunity on the last Sunday of the year to look back at God's faithfulness and say, yes, in this moment, I'm going to remember, I'm going to review how good God has been to me. I'm going to remember God's faithfulness. I'm going to remember how good he's been to me. I'm going to remember, remember how he's right on time every time.
In the book of Luke, I believe it's chapter 17, we see the story of 10 lepers. 10 lepers, and it says they cry out to Jesus, have mercy on us, have mercy on us. And Jesus does, he has mercy on them. He says, go show yourself to the priest. It says, and as they went, as they went, they were made well. And it says, out of those 10, it says that, that one realized he saw what was going on in his body. And when he saw, it says that he returned. He returned. He returned and went back to Jesus. And it says he began to say loudly, gave glory to God loudly, and he fell on his face and worshiped Jesus and gave him thanks. Gave him thanks. I thought, how appropriate is that? For, for all 10 of those people, Jesus turned things around in their life, right? With leprosy, hopeless, going to die like this, never going to see family, going to be put off in a corner somewhere of, of, of a village somewhere, of, far away, can't be with anybody. And Jesus turns it all around for them. Their whole life is changed. And yet only one returns. Only one returns I began to think about how many times God has turned things for our life and instead of us turning around, see what God has turned in our life, we should in return turn around because he turned it, I'm going to turn because he turned things around for me, I'm gonna turn my face right back to him. I'm gonna turn my, my, my voice right up to him. I'm gonna point my heart toward him and, and instead, of, instead of just going about my way and going about my life, and I'm gonna stop, I'm gonna turn back and I'm gonna say, oh Lord, thank you. It says that with a loud voice, come on, with a loud voice, he said, thank you Lord. Thank you, Lord. And he got on his face and he worshiped and he gave him thanks. It's so easy to just receive all that God has done for us and to just go about our merry way and not give him thanks for how good he's been to us. Not give him thanks, not return what he is worthy of because of what he has turned in our life. I asked you a few minutes ago, if you remember that one time, God really turned it around. When you received his grace and his salvation, you were saved, amen, by his blood, through faith in him. So many of you lifted your hands. You said, amen. You got excited. You know why? It's because it's like you just slip right back into that very moment. If it was a year ago, if it was 10 years ago, if it was 50 years ago, it's like you just, it's like you just slide right back. You're like, oh yeah, I remember. I remember. I, that, that's because even though your body's getting older, your spirit's renewed, your spirit's still young, your spirit's renewed. And you say, well, my 50 years may have gone by, but my spirit still remembers when the life of God came on the inside, when it was made brand new. My spirit still remembers what it was like to be in darkness and to be bound, but yet now be set free. It's easy. It's easy to forget. It's easy to have uh, uh, amnesia sometimes. I think uh, even as Christians, sometimes it's easy to have what uh, I think what is best called selective amnesia. You know what I mean by selective amnesia? Like you, you kind you can choose you kind of choosing which things to forget or. Kids can be that way sometimes, can't they? Kind of forget, but we can, we can still be that way when we get older. We just kind of, you know, you maybe look back on the year and maybe look back and all you can remember is some of the rough stuff. Like, well, that happened. Oh, we lost this and this happened, that happened, that happened. And then you kind of wonder where God is at. But if you really stop and look at how God showed up time and time again. You know, my, my little boy, Judy, he's a wonderful little fellow. Love him with all of my heart. And uh, on Christmas Day, about, about time to get in bed 
And um, I was putting him in, in bed. Come on. And I said, Jude, you know, and I don't know what you asked or what you said to your kids right before they went to bed Christmas Eve or Christmas night, whatever. And uh, I said, Jude, did you have a great Christmas? You know, and, I mean, you know, after you, you spend a little money and put any kind of energy or effort into anything Christmas, you expect what? Cartwheels, right? I mean, cartwheels and dancing and shouting and hugs and kisses and you're the best dad in the history of the universe and you and mom are the best. Y'all do great things for us for Christmas. I said, you have a great day? He goes, he goes, mm. I didn't really have that much fun. That's what he said. Didn't really have that much fun. I said, are you serious? He said, yeah, I didn't really have that much fun. I said, I said, well, let's, let's talk about the day then. Let's think about it. I said, think about all the wonderful gifts that you got, that you got from your, your grandparents and from us. And I started naming some of the different gifts, and he's, his eyes lit up a little bit. Like, oh, yeah, that's pretty nice. I said, remember, and then, remember how we had cinnamon rolls right after all that? Mm, yeah, that was pretty good. And I started naming how you saw your cousins and you saw your, your family, got to see everybody. You got happier. Remember how you played, you played basketball with Aiden in, the, in, in your room, you know, and you all had a dunk contest. Remember, you got happier and happier the more I got to talking. Remember how you played video games and you got this video game thing? And he's like, oh, you got happier and happier by the time he got in bed. I said, did you have a good Christmas? He goes, yeah, I had a great Christmas. <laughs> funny though but he had a great Christmas but sometimes it's easy just to forget because you're thinking about maybe a, a specific moment that you're in right now and you're thinking I mean for him all he's thinking is I don't want to get in bed right now why are you making me get in bed and because you're making me get in bed I don't really think I'm very happy right now right it's just a little immaturity is all he's seven years old but when I begin to tell you you know you know what I'm talking about don't you but when I began to remind him of how wonderful a Christmas he really had, he got happy. He went to bed with a smile on his face. I mean, he's just thinking about how really great Christmas was for him. And sometimes in our lives, we're the exact same way. We may be going through a moment or a season or just a time where it's like, boy, this is not perfect. I, I really don't want to do that right now. Or this may be difficult or a challenge, and it may be just something very simple as far as obedience or sacrifice or something, something happened with somebody, but just a moment of disappointment or pain or heartache or something like that. You're going through a moment of that, and many times when we're going through a moment like that, we have a tendency to forget the mass amounts of God's grace and favor and blessing over a year or over a lifetime, and we think, yeah, but I'm really missing in this or I'm really hurt by this. Or, forget about the one moment or the very, very, the very, very, very momentary disappointment of that, that very moment and just, and look back on the great body of work that is filled with the favor of God. Amen. Children of Israel had uh, issues with this. In Deuteronomy chapter 8, Deuteronomy chapter 8, it says uh, in verse 10, actually, I, I want to just read a little bit more to you. Deuteronomy chapter 8, it says this, and this is the Lord talking to his kids. He says, every commandment which I command you today, this is verse 1, so wherever you're at, you can catch up once you find it. Every command which I command you today, you must be careful to observe that you may live and multiply and go in and possess the land of which the Lord swore to your fathers. And you shall remember. Everybody say remember. Amen. Remember that the Lord your God led you all the way these 40 years in the wilderness to humble you and to test you, to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. So he humbled you and allowed you to hunger and fed you with manna, which you did not know, nor did your fathers know that he might make you know that man shall not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Your garments did not wear out on you, nor did your foot swell these 40 years. Now, now God, God doesn't, you know, uh, halfway use words, you know what I mean? Like, I think I'll throw this in there. God is purposefully reminding them of what he's done for them. What does he say that he's done for them? 
He talks about how he fed them with manna. Think about that. Bread from heaven. I fed you with bread from heaven. Okay. Not only that, 40 years your clothes didn't wear out. 40 years you went for a 40-year hike and yet your feet never swole up. Come on, somebody, y'all. Your feet swole walking through the mall last week. <laughs> Standing in line at Best Buy, you know what I mean? You, you, your feet still swole up from that. And 40 years of a trek. And God's just saying, I just want to remind you about your feet. Think of, isn't that funny that the Lord would say, I want to remind you about your feet, okay? And I want to remind you about your clothes. And I want to remind you about the bread that you took for granted, complained about, but I still want to remind you about it. He said, you should know in your heart that as a man chastens his son, so the Lord your God chastens you. Therefore, you shall keep the commandments of the Lord your God to walk in his ways and, and to fear him. For the Lord your God is bringing you into a good land. A land of brooks of water, of fountains and springs that flow out of valleys and hills. A land of wheat, barley, and of vines and fig trees and pomegranates. A land of olive oil and honey. A land in which you will eat bread without scarcity, in which you will lack nothing. A land whose stones are, are iron and out of whose hills you can dig copper. Now notice, he takes, what, four verses here or five verses uh, or so, I believe four verses, and he just explains to them where he's taking them. So he takes a few verses and says, remember how good I have been to you, how faithful I have been to you, but remember this, I'm still taking you somewhere. Amen. I've got somewhere that I'm taking you, and it's going to be really good. A lot of times, the Lord is reminding you of how good he has been to you, and he doesn't want you to forget that because he's not done with his goodness towards you, and he knows if he can get you to remember how good he has been to you, that when you get to the new place, you won't forget the good stuff that he's doing for you then and there. I just think it's cool. God just gets so specific. He's, he tells it what's going to be in the land. There's going to be wheat and barley and pomegranates and olive oil and honey. I mean, you're going to have enough bread to have more than enough bread. He says, when you have eaten and are full, he says, then you shall bless the Lord your God for the good land which he has given you. What is that? Remembering the God who turned things around for us, brought us out of the wilderness, and brought us into a land of great blessing. Anybody believe God's bringing you into a land of great blessing? Anybody thankful for the land of great blessing that he has already brought you into? Amen. He says, beware. You know, anytime God says beware, you better pay attention. Beware that you do not forget the Lord your God. By not keeping his commandments and his judgments and his statutes, which I command you today. Lest when you have eaten and are full and you have built beautiful houses and dwell in them. And when your herds and your flocks multiply and your silver and your gold are multiplied and all that you have is multiplied. When your heart is lifted up and you forget the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. Now, notice, he just brings it all back again. He goes, I'm bringing you to a wonderful place, a place of blessing and prosperity. You're going to have more than enough. He goes, but just remember, I'm the one who brought you out of slavery. You were in bondage. Now, notice, he's not upset that they have all this good stuff. He says, I'm the one that's bringing you into the good stuff. I'm bringing you there. He says, but don't. Don't let your heart get in the wrong place. Who led you through that great and terrible wilderness in which were fiery serpents and scorpions and thirsty land where there was no water? Who brought water for you out of the flinty rock? Isn't that something? Just want to remind you about the rock that water came out of. Amazing. <laughs> Who fed you in the wilderness with manna which your fathers did not know that he might humble you, that he might test you to do good in the end, he tells them twice about the manna. Then you say in your heart, my power and the might of my hand have gained me this wealth. And you shall remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you power to get wealth, that he may establish his covenant, which he swore to your fathers as it is this day. God's saying, oh, what I'm doing for you is about my covenant with you. 
It says, then it shall be if, if you by any means forget the Lord your God and follow other gods and serve them and worship them, I testify against you this day that you shall surely perish. Boy, it's going to be rough if you do. He says, I want you to remember. I want you to think about Just like I went through with Jude and just listed all the good things from one day or a couple of days of Christmas season. God's going right here, and he's going much bigger than just Christmas gifts. He's saying, I brought you out of bondage. I fed you. I brought you through the wilderness. I delivered you, and I'm bringing you into a very blessed, prosperous, really wealthy place. And I'm the one who's given you the power to get it. Don't you forget it. Don't you forget it. Remember me. Remember me. Remember my faithfulness. Remember my faithfulness. Children of Israel, many times they would forget all of these types of things and say, yeah, but, you know, uh, this didn't happen and that's not happened. We're tired of eating this. And they just, just complain and complain and complain. He says, no, give thanks to me for the one who turned things around for you. Praise God. (laughs) Hallelujah. Hallelujah. (laughs) Amen. Do you remember the story of blind Bartimaeus? Cried out to Jesus, have mercy on me. Amen. Jesus eventually calls him. What do you want? He says, that I may receive my sight. He receives his sight. I've been thinking about this and actually preached along along these lines a few weeks ago. But I was thinking about this, how it doesn't say that blind Bartimaeus, after he received his sight, said, I'm going to Disney World. It doesn't say it, does it? Right? It doesn't say, I'm going to eat some catfish. I've been, been wanting to do that. Going to see auntie and uncle. I can't wait. You know, I'm missing my aunts and uncle. Can't wait to go find. No. Boy, I'm going on that vacation I've been really thinking about all these years. No. It says what? It says that he followed Jesus. He followed Jesus. Amen. Wow. Wow. How many times do people, to us, many people, God does magnificent things in their life. They get set free, eyes opened, walk in liberty and joy and blessing, only to no longer follow the one who set them free. I've seen it happen time and time again. I'm certainly not you, of course, you're here, but I've seen it happen time and time again. God does miraculous things in people's life, their marriage their family, their business, their finances. God rains down his blessing and grace upon their life. And as soon as things get turned around in their life, they forget the one who turned them around. They go, I'm doing really good now. I really don't need all that now. Until three or four years go by, five years go by, who knows the timetable, but time goes by. Once things really get down again, well, whew. I need to go back to the Lord. Well, by all means, it's a good time to come back to the Lord. Any time's a good time to come back to the Lord. But why not just follow? When he turns things around, why not just follow? Why not just stay close with the one who turned things around for you? Just stay close with the one who's been so good, who's been so faithful. One of the greatest ways to stay close to the one who turns things around for you is to constantly remember how good he's been. I know that the Bible teaches, remember ye not the former things, consider not the things of old. I know that there's a lot of things that we're not supposed to remember, but if there's anything that we should remember, it's the faithfulness of God. If there's anything you should look back and recount, you ought to be able to recount how good God has been. Look at how faithful he's been. Hallelujah. In 2 Chronicles chapter 20, 2 Chronicles chapter 20, the children of Israel and their king Jehoshaphat, they're, they're in a bad position. 
They're in a bad position. They have armies that are coming against them. It looks like they're going to be defeated. They turn their face to the Lord. They begin to seek him, pray fast, begin to seek the Lord. The Lord gives them direction. He begins to speak to them and gives them guidance on what to do. They hear what the Lord is saying through the prophet of God. They obey what he's saying to do. And it says they set out uh, singers and praisers, those to play instruments, to be at the very front of the battle lines. They began to say and to sing, for the Lord is good and his mercy endures forever. For the Lord is good and his mercy endures forever. Notice they begin to say that or sing that even before things turned around. Even before things turned around, they turned to God and said, Lord, we want to honor you. We want to declare. It's amazing that they began to declare his goodness even before they saw his goodness in that specific situation. Lord, you are good and your mercy endures forever. Lord, you are good and your mercy endures forever. Lord, you are good and your mercy endures forever. Lord, you are good and your mercy endures forever. Lord, you are good and your mercy endures forever. Who knows how many times they said that? Who knows how many times they declared that? Who knows how many times that they sang it, but they just kept singing. They just kept saying, the Lord is good and his mercy endures forever. Declaring the goodness of God. Declaring the faithfulness of God. Declaring the mercy of God. Declaring how wonderful he is. Declaring that, man, in the middle of what, what's going to be disastrous. We're going to be defeated. We're going to be slaughtered. And it says that the enemy began to turn on themselves. And they were self-slaughtered. Self-slaughtered. And it says that the children of Israel were three days gathering up the remains, the spoil of that victory. Some of y'all looked it up. I want to read it to you. Second Chronicles chapter 20. After all of this, this is what I want you to see. After all of this, verse 25 says, Second Chronicles 20, 25. says, when Jehoshaphat and his people came to take away their spoil, they found among them an abundance of valuables on the dead bodies and precious jewelry which they stripped off for themselves more than they could carry away and they were three days gathering the spoil because there was so much but notice something and on the fourth day on the fourth day we love the three days but what do you do on the fourth on the fourth day they assembled in the valley of Baraka, that means blessing or prosperity. They assembled, amen, in the valley of Baraka, for there they blessed the Lord. Therefore, the name of that place was called the valley of Baraka until this day. Then they returned every man of Judah and Jerusalem with Jehoshaphat in front of them to go back to Jerusalem with joy for the Lord had made them rejoice over their enemies. Come on, he had turned it around for them. So they came to Jerusalem with stringed instruments and harps and trumpets to the house of the Lord. And the fear of God was on all the kingdoms of those countries when they heard that the Lord had fought against the enemies of Israel. And I like this last part too. Then the realm of Jehoshaphat was quiet for God had gave him rest all around. All of the enemies that were against him, at the end, all is well. All is at peace. Amen. You know what most people call the valley in their life? That's a bad spot, right? That's, that's, I want to be on the mountaintop, not the valley. You ever heard somebody say, even Christians are going through a valley experience right now. It's kind of, in, I'm in a valley. But what, what did God do in this valley? Come on, what did God do in this valley? He turned it from a valley of defeat. 
He turned it from a valley of, (laughs) this makes me happy, sorry y'all. I'm still recovering from all the ham, but I'm still happy right now. He turned it from a valley of despair and death and turmoil and poverty and utter destruction and he turned it into a valley of blessing. And to this very day, on this very day, it is still called the valley of blessing. And what was the darkest dip? What was the worst moment and the worst season? Now, every time they talk about it, every time they see it, anytime anybody walks through it, what is there a declaration of? This is the valley of God's blessing. This is the valley of God's prosperity. This is the valley where God turned everything around in our life. This is the valley where we declared his goodness. This is the valley where we declared his mercy. This is the valley where we saw him defeat our enemies before our faces. This is the valley where he gave us rest. This is the valley where he gave us peace. This is the valley where it took us three days to gather his blessing in our life. And at the end of it all, we will declare it from this day forward, the valley that would be a valley of of death and blood and destruction is now a valley of God's blessing. So we will go back to the place we came from And we will go back with thanksgiving in our heart. We'll go back with joy. We'll go back with celebration. We'll go back with singing. We'll go back with dancing. We'll go back with shouting. We'll go back rejoicing in the goodness of God. Rejoicing in the faithfulness of God. Rejoicing. Man. And I I see this for us. And I see this for you this year. That... The valley that would be a valley of defeat where you may be surrounded is going to turn into the valley of God's greatest blessing, God's greatest victory, God's greatest demonstration of his power in your life. I see it turning around, turning around, turning around, turning it around. But for them, the key was they turned their heart toward the Lord. They turned their heart toward God. They set their heart toward Him. They began to seek Him. They began to pray. They began to sing and to praise. They began to declare the goodness of God before before He even gave them the victory in the natural, in, in the supernatural. They're declaring the goodness of God right in the middle of their most difficult challenge. The Lord is good. His mercy endures forever.